Welcome once again to Bible Class Topics. Today we're continuing our study of Matthew's Gospel and we're going to look at chapter 20. Here's our outline that we've been using. We're in the third section of our study, Facing Rejection. This will continue on through the end of chapter 25. In the section Facing Rejection, we're in our third and final part of that, Questions, Discourses, and Parables of Judgment. I've divided Matthew 20 into the following topics. First, we'll take a couple of looks at verses 1 through 16. The master seeks his workers, work and wages in the kingdom of God. We'll take a look at towards the cross. Then the bulk of our study will be spent looking at verses 20 through 28, the faults and the true ambition, the mind of Jesus, the Christian revolution, the Lordship of the Cross, and then we'll conclude our study of Matthew chapter 20 with love's answer to need's appeal. Let's get our Bibles out and read these first 16 verses. I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right I will give you. So they went. Going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing. And he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the eleventh hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now when those hired the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only for one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first shall be last. This parable describes a typical situation during the very short and precarious grape harvesting season in Palestine. The pay that was offered to the early morning workers was a normal day's wage for this type of work. The men waiting to be hired were obviously seriously looking for work and even those uh, that hope to sign on for even an hour at the end of the day. Because slaves and servants were attached to a family, they were less likely to go hungry than these day laborers and their families. These workers lived day to day, as we say, hand to mouth. So missing any day's work meant no food on the table that night. The hours expressed in the parable according to the Jewish way of reckoning. This parable served as a warning to the disciples. In Christ, seniority does not necessarily mean a place of honor. This leads us to Christ always showing them how to be servant leaders. Secondly, it warned the Jews to not think too highly of themselves as God's chosen people. We see this thinking carried over into the early church when Jewish Christians were skeptical about receiving Gentiles into the church and even tried to bind circumcision on Gentiles. It does contain a lesson on the comfort of God. Regardless of when you enter his kingdom, you are accepted as an equal with all who came before. Likewise, those that die young in the Lord are held equal with those who live and serve long. 
Not only does it teach a lesson on the comfort of God, it teaches a, a lesson about God's infin infinite compassion. The men were waiting in the marketplace because no one hired them. In all fairness, those that worked fewer hours should have received less pay. But God's tenderness, his mercy, and his compassion made up the difference for these latecomers who needed a day's wage to support their family. God not only believes that every man has the right to work, but he has the right to make a living from his wage. Besides the comfort of God and infinite compassion of God, the parable also shows us the generosity of God. In God's eyes, all service ranks the same. It is not the amount of service given, it is the love with which it is given that counts. Whatever God does give, it is of His grace. We did not earn it, not even close. What we receive from God is not a reward as such, but it is a gift. This parable teaches us that the whole point of work is the spirit in which it is done. The first group made a contract to work for one day's pay. You'll notice the other groups made no contract. A Christian's first concern in his spiritual life is not pay. Not what do I get out of it, such as Peter sometimes asks. The first will be last, and the last will be first. To judge our standing in the church as the world counts greatness is doomed for failure. On, on many are called but few are chosen, Chumbly has this to say in his commentary, that many are called but few are chosen doesn't mean salvation is limited to a select few. But it's a an example of the figure of speech wherein a part stands for the whole. See verse 28 and also chapter 22, verse 14. God offers blessing. We see chapter 19, 27 through 29. He offers the blessing to all, as we saw in chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll see again in chapter 28, verse 19. So he offers blessing to all, but only a few will accept his offer. As we've already studied in the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, and we've already studied in, our, in chapter 19, verses 21 and 22. So, if we think of ourselves as God's employees, well then we'll be as baffled by the owner's behavior in the parable as these people were in the first century. We work for God, but we are not God's employees. If we think of ourselves as God's employees, we risk missing the story's point, that God dispenses gifts, not wages. None of us gets paid according to merit, for none of us comes close to satisfying God's requirement for a perfect life. If paid on the basis of fairness, then we would all end up in hell. Chumbly quoted that from Philip Yancey's book, What's So Amazing About Grace, pages 61 and 62. Let's continue reading. Chapter 20. Let's read 17, 18, and 19. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the twelve disciples aside, and on the way he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priest and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised up on the third day. This is the third mention of the cross in our study. We've already seen this in chapter 16, verse 21, and chapter 17, verse 22 and 23. In Mark's account, chapter 10, verses 32 through 34, Mark tells us that Jesus walked ahead by himself 
and that the disciples were amazed and afraid. Then reading from Luke chapter 18, 31 through 34, Luke tells us that he took the disciples alone to try to compel them to understand what was about to happen. Jesus would suffer mentally, physically, and emotionally. His heart would be broken by betrayal and disloyalty. Then he would be unjustly condemned to death. He would suffer humiliation and deliberate insult at the hands of the Romans and the Jewish leaders. He would be scourged, that is, namely, he would be tortured. And finally, he would be crucified to death. Except, that's not finally. There is a but. But he would be resurrected. Because beyond the cross was the crown. And beyond the defeat was the triumph, and beyond death there was life. Let's continue our reading. Verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? And she said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one on your left, in your kingdom. And Jesus answered, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand at my left hand is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my Father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The question often comes up, were James and John Jesus' first cousins? From a reading of all the accounts of this story, it appears that they were, their mother being Salome, Mary's sister. You might want to look at Matthew 27, 56, Mark 15, 40, and John 19, 25. So this request from the mother of the sons of Zebedee could be the request of an aunt to her nephew. But let's talk more importantly about the disciples' ambition. First, they were looking for personal reward and personal distinction. To sit on the right and left hand of the Lord in his kingdom we, we often talk of the right-hand man in our own vernacular, and the left-hand man is not quite far behind. Secondly, they were looking for personal success without personal sacrifice. Thirdly, they were looking for a royal command to give them a princely life. Jesus has to remind them that true greatness in his kingdom comes one way, and that way is through service. However, even in these dark hours, the disciples still had a faith in Jesus that led them to believe the kingdom would come. So regardless of this situation that we read about here in 20 through 28, where it appears the two brothers were trying to get the upper hand over the ten, we see that all the disciples had an unshakable loyal, loyalty even when told the best seats were not necessarily reserved for them, they all followed on. Let's talk about the Christian life, and let's talk about drinking Jesus' cup. He asked them, can you bear the cup? Well, we know that James was the first apostle to die. Meanwhile, his brother John was the last to die. So how did they share the cup? 
But we have to think about what the Christian cup is. What is it that they shared? The Christian cup is not necessarily martyrdom. It might be the long routine of Christian life, the daily sacrifices, the heartbreaks, the disappointments, the tears, and the struggles. To drink the cup, we must follow Jesus wherever he leads us. Why would even a devout Jew be willing to be martyred? Because even a devout Jew willing to be martyred would have a fear of death by crucifixion. In Deuteronomy 21 and 23, we read that it cursed is he who hangs upon the tree. Let's look a little more closely at Jesus himself. First, let's talk about his kindness. He does not lose his temper with the mother and the two sons, but explains the truth of the matter in a gentle, sympathetic, loving, and patient way. So he's kind. Secondly, he's honest. He did not hedge about the bitter cup. Your life might end in crown wearing, but it will be lived in cross-bearing. And Jesus also shows us his trust in men. He knew that James and John would remain loyal, regardless of the current blindness, regardless of the wrong ambitions and their mistaken ideas. When he looks at us and sees our weak moments, he still trusts us. He still continues to believe in us. This makes Christianity revolutionary. The other disciples were naturally annoyed by the crest of James and John. Cousins or not, why should these two hold preeminence? Jesus reminds them that his kingdom does not operate according to the world's rules. The Christian's only badge of greatness is service. Beyond greatness comes honor, and to achieve that, a Christian must become a servant. In our own way of talking, a Christian must become a slave. Somehow, even the world has come to accept these standards. They know a good man is someone who helps others. They might respect or even fear the, the man of power but the world will still love the man of love. Where lies the greatness? And how many people? A man has at his beck and call? Is that where the greatness is? What of a man's intellectual or academic standing? Is that where the greatness is? How about how many committees he's the chairman of. Is that where the greatness is? How big his bank account is? How much material possessions he has acquired? Jesus could care less about any of these things. Jesus only wants to know one thing. How many people have you helped? Sadly, this wishing for preeminence still can be found in Christian churches even at this date. Just as it plagued the apostolic group, we find out men often aspire for leadership, not that they might serve others, but that they might exploit them and be served. Currently, we are studying in Bible class at my local congregation, the book of Jude. And part of Jude's denunciation of false teachers is along these very lines. These men, these false teachers that have snuck in among the church, are only there for their own benefit and not for the benefit of the church or the individual Christians.
Jesus does not call on us to do something he did not do. He came to occupy a cross, not a throne, and thus the Jews could not grasp what he was all about. The Messiah that the Jews dreamed of was a conquering king. He was a mighty leader that would restore Israel to the time of David and Solomon. Jesus restated and remade royalty and kinship into a glory that consisted of suffering love and sacrificial service. The Son of Man came to give his life as a ransom for many. To whom was this ransom to be paid? The devil? Well, that's the wrong question to ask. Don't ask who to whom was this ransom to be paid. The question is, for what was this ransom to be paid? Unconverted man is in the grip of evil's power which he cannot break alone. Sins have separated them from God. Sins have wrecked their lives and the lives of their loved ones and neighbors. What was the price to bring man back to God? We know that that price was the death of Jesus on the cross. G. Campbell Morgan said this, By sacrifice a man fits himself for power. By self-abnegation, by actual denial of self and readiness to serve, does a man climb to the throne of power as he retains his badge of service? Yes, I had to look up self-abnegation. And I'll leave that to you as well. But in the second phrase, he, G. Campbell Morgan pretty much describes what it is. An actual denial of self and readiness to serve. Putting others in front of yourself. Leon Morris said this, To see one's heart set on eminence is to lose the very heart of the Christian way. Let's finish reading the rest of our chapter. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed, and behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight, and they followed him. These two men were waiting for an opportunity, and when it came along, they jumped at it. Putting something off until a more convenient time often results in that more convenient time never coming. For two cases of that, I suggest you go look at Acts 17.32 and Acts 26.28. These blind men could not be discouraged. It was customary for the rabbi to teach as he walked along the road. These men were making so much noise the followers could not hear Jesus. They refused to stop shouting for Jesus to help them. When Jesus tells people to seek and ye shall find, these two blind men exemplify that. But they had faith, but their faith was incomplete. Even though their faith was incomplete, they acted on the faith they had. They believed Jesus to be the Messiah. He called, they called him the son of David. But they were most likely thinking along the lines that the Jews and even the apostles still thought, and that was in terms of an earthly deliverer. At this point, even though their faith was not complete, Jesus accepted their faith, what faith they did have. Their request was great. 
but though their request was great, they were not afraid to bring it to the Lord. What honest request is too great to bring to Jesus? Finally, these two men were grateful. Once they received their request, they remained to follow Jesus. How many people are guilty of forgetting where their blessing came from? Not even giving thanks for their blessings. We can never repay God for his blessing, but we can receive the blessing with thanksgiving and remain loyal followers for life. Jesus then is trying to teach his disciples a lesson. And that lesson is, if he is their leader and he came to serve and not be served, they also need to be in that frame of mind. We'll close our lesson on chapter 20 with a quote from Kenneth Chumbly's commentary. This account of Jesus healing the blind men occupies a strategic place in this gospel. Not only is it the end of the account of Jesus' itinerant ministry, but it uniquely typifies the importance of the lowly service about which he had just spoken. At a time when his mind might be preoccupied by his impending death, he was still moved by compassion. He was moved by compassion to help men whom others considered beneath his dignity. Clearly, this son of David then did not come to be served, but to serve. Thank you so much for attending this lesson today. Your, view, your view, views and viewership are greatly appreciated. If you have a chance, please subscribe to this channel. Ring the notification bell. Leave me a like or a dislike. Leave me a comment. Next time we get together in our study of Matthew, we'll begin a look at chapter 21. Until then, may God bless.